Let's continue. And let's play black against Assad. All right, so let's go e5. Let's go e5. We haven't gone e5 very much in the speed run. And I'm not sure why that is. I, I, I want to go e5 because I think most people in the chat still do play e5. So we're going to play this old school. Okay, so Scotch. Scotch defend d4. All right, um, I should have played the Stafford. Yeah, I, sh I will, I will play the Stafford. Oh, I promise I'll play the Stafford next time. Um, okay, so that's a Scotch. And we take the pawn, as you guys know. And here white has a choice. He can go bishop c4, yeah, that's the Scotch gambit. That's the Scotch gambit. Now, I'm trying, I'm debating how to get, how to go about this. Okay. So I want to make a point which perhaps will be obvious to some, but perhaps relieving to others. When you can sense that your opponent is entering a line that you don't know very much about, and you're afraid that you're going to get crushed if you enter the main theoretical, theoretical sequence, you can often make a very quiet move and accept a slightly worse position but ensure that you're not going to get blown off the board. And I, I wanna show you guys what that looks like. Who can tell me what the main move is here? There's actually two main moves. What are they? What are the moves that are the most principled? The first is knight f6. And then after e5, we have the move d5, just to, after e5, we have d5. And the second is bishop c5, trying to cling to this pawn. I'll show you a little bit of the theory after the game. But let's say that we wanted to avoid the theory. We wanted to play super solid chess, even if it's a little bit passive. Let's play bishop e7. Let's prevent him from going knight g5. This ensures that we're gonna be able to complete our development in peace. Okay, c3. Now d takes c3 is a blunder. This is a very famous trap. d takes c3 is a blunder. Why? Because of queen to d5, and if you look at that very carefully, it turns out that there's no good way of stopping the checkmate on f7. The only way thing you could do is play knight h6, but then he just takes the knight and he's up a piece. Okay, so what do we do? We can't take the pawn. What are our options here? Well, remember, when there's a situation like this, you have three main options. You can ignore, you can ca accept, but you, can, you also have sort of a fourth option, which is to try to sacrifice back the pawn on your own terms. Sacrifice back the pawn on your own terms. Resign is a fifth option. And when you want to sacrifice back the pawn on your own terms, knight f6, there is still e5, very nasty move. Let's give the pawn up by playing d3. Let's try to disallow him from getting a dominant pawn center by forcing him to take the pawn in this version, although he doesn't have to take the pawn. He has a very strong move, queen b3 here, which he knows, wow. Okay, so I've actually, but but I, but as far as I remember, let me think. No, as far as I remember, this is not the move. Okay, as far as I remember, this is not the move, but I did get, you know, I got, I did precisely what um, I said we wouldn't do, which is get into some theory. This is a very nasty move. This is a very nasty move because this pawn is extremely hard to defend. It is impossible to defend. Now, one of the things that some of you are familiar with is, um, is a technique of meeting this move where you go knight a5, bishop f7, king f8, and you try to disattach the queen from the knight. And um, I'm just trying to calculate that to see if it has any chance of working. And I think it does. Let's go knight a5, I think it does. This is far from simple. He, he, because he has a very strong move in this position. Let's see if he finds it. The tempting move is to go queen to d5, trying to keep the queen on the same diagonal as the bishop. I think queen d5 is a mistake. I think queen d5 is a mistake. Why is it a mistake? Now, you guys might look at this and say, yeah, it's very similar to the Evans, good connection. This knight is hanging, his bishop is defended. What could possibly be wrong with this move? But we play c6, attack queen, defends the knight simultaneously. And the queen is going to be out of... Oh, wait. There is a move, though. Wow. 
No, he does have something he can do. My man. It's still very, very close to being lost for him, though. Hmm. Yep, that's going out fine. I'll be completely honest with you guys. I forgot that after knight h6, forking the queen and the bishop, I forgot about the bishop. I forgot that he could take on h6. But that's okay. That's okay. We don't have to declare mayday to continue our airplane analogy. All we need to do is identify what the big issues are. The big issue is that he's threatening some sort of a discovered check against our king. What can black do here? We have two possible moves. We can go knight f6 to intercept uh, the queen and the bishop. I like that move a lot. And our other move is to, well, give the bishop f6. But bishop f6 I like a lot less because he can take the knight. So let's go knight f6. We could also have moved the deep on, and I'll show you guys afterward. Yeah, d6, and then covering a discovered check with the knight would have been possible. I'll show you guys some of the complications afterward. Let's go knight f6. Development is the priority. Knight g5. This guy is like the second coming of Tall. Okay, now let's try to understand what's going on here. The knight is defending the bishop, so what seems to be the most plausible way to continue? Fire is on board, but I think we're going to emerge victorious. Let's be very logical here. I have the same question that you guys have. Let's go h6, let's say, get out of here. I don't believe you. I don't see any mates here, and you gotta be very careful. Very, in such situations, what do you need to check for? You need to look for checks. You need to make sure that there are no weird mating sequences. This is protected. This is protected. You know, um, there's clearly no, no immediate mate here, but you would have to be very cautious in checking for that. Okay. This is Russian school of chess. Very concrete. E5. Okay, that is a really nice move. All right, but it's it's not good enough. So e5 counterattacks the knight. And this position is less complicated than it appears because we, our hand is forced here. Our hand is forced. What do we need to do? What do we have to do? We, I mean, obviously we have to take his knight and then after ef we have to take his pawn. There's no other choice. We can't do things our way. Because if we had gone d6, then he would have had the e6 square to put one of his pieces. All right. No, this is uh, this guy is playing much stronger than, than 1500. But I still think that we are going to emerge victorious from the tactical skirmish here. He's 100% not cheating, and I don't want to hear any, any accusations to that. And when I say he's playing better than his rating, that means he's good. That <laughs> doesn't mean anything else. All right. We can breathe. We can breathe. We've got a little bit of room to maneuver our pieces and we need to pounce. We have to pounce um, quickly or else he'll develop his pieces and again, we'll start experiencing problems. So what does it even mean to pounce? Well, what moves can we make here? A lot of you guys are proposing d5. That's a good move conceptually because you open up the bishop, but is there anything more concrete that you may notice here? Remember, he's not castled yet. That's something that you should play around with. Okay, he's not castled. What can we do about it? Well, you could play queen e7 check. I like to start with this move to see what he does. If he plays bishop e3, sky bottles your move, knight c4 comes in, activating the knight. His best move and a very professional move here would be queen to e4. That's a move which, you know, 1500s don't usually make because it's, you know, it, it involves realizing that you trade the queens and that pawn on d3 is a goner. So the end game, the resulting end game is going to be equal. All right. Okay. This should be three. That's understandable. And now, does the move knight c4 make sense to everybody? Why can't he pin the queen to the king? Well, remember, the bishop is itself pinned. We have to speed up a little bit here. Knight c4, it is. And uh, we are beginning to overtake the initiative. Slowly but surely. Yeah, he has to play queen takes d3. He has no other choice. He has to take this pawn. Okay, castles. Now that is a particularly spicy move. Let me see. It's not as bad as it looks. Okay. Yeah, so the problem is if we play d5 here... It, it, uh, he plays queen takes d3, folks. 
d5, queen takes d3. And I'm calculating a really cool line. Oh my god. Wait, 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 guys. I gotta calculate something. There's there's genuinely complex line there that I'm trying to work work through. And I think it works for us. It's not it's not beautiful, but it's it's cool it's it's cool in a complex sense. We start with d5, this looks like a blunder. We start with d5. We start with d5. Okay, this move is understandable. We activate the bishop, but it may seem like a mistake. We are essentially forcing him to take the pawn. Okay, now what's her idea? Is it to take the pawn on b2? No, ah, he doesn't take the pawn. He makes a blunder. I'll show you guys afterward. This is a blunder. Why? What should you be looking for? Well, you should immediately spot the bishop and, and the queen. They're on knight's distance apart. And of course, the simple knight e5 results in a fork against the queen and the bishop. And uh, he is starting to burn. Vladi, thank you. Yeah, this is basically GG. And I've, I've mentioned this many times before. The notion that sometimes these players are incredibly good in the opening. They play a bunch of good tactical moves, but if you just keep your composure, they will lose their cool. They'll, they'll, lose, their, they'll lose their composure before you lose yours. And you just got to outlast them sometimes in the calculation. Okay, now how should we go about winning this as quickly as possible? Well, we need to realize what our assets are. Our first asset is that we're up a piece. That's great. Our second asset is that we have the H file. How can we exploit it? Well, we can exploit it in a, in a variety of ways. Perhaps some of you are indicating queen e5. That's a lovely move. That's a lovely move because you're inducing one of several weaknesses, either h3 or g3. And this is a great example of not needing a pawn storm. We are still attacking. We don't need a pawn storm. Why? Because we already have the open files served to us. So we don't need to push this g pawn forward. In fact, that would be very counterproductive. f4. All right. What should we take with? What seems more natural? So it seems more natural, more simple to take with a pawn. Well, sorry, to take with a knight. Take with a knight. Uh, just to just to uh, force another trade, perhaps get, get rid of his bishop. And uh, this is totally winning. We're up a piece. We have this square for our queen in case we want to trade queens. That's very possible as well. Um, and in fact, if he goes knight to d2... I propose that the simplest, if you're in time pressure and you want to guarantee win, don't... Well, f3, he goes knight takes f3. f3, knight takes f3, and he defends the pawn on h2. Thank you, Gari. Thank you so much, Gari. Rating just what we needed. 113 coming over. I know it's lame, but let's go for the queen trade. I know it's lame, but if we have a minute and a half, we can go for the queen trade because you know that you can play very fast and relatively accurately in the resulting endgame. All right. Thank you so much, Gary. Hope, hope you had a great stream. Welcome, guys. Tail end of my speed run. Hope you guys stick around. Um, we have some instructive analyzing to do. This was a really cool game. Now, what should? how should we coordinate our pieces? What are the priorities here? What is the top priority, and how should we go about getting this priority accomplished? Yeah, so we need to develop. We need to develop in order to defend this pawn. Now, if we play bishop g4, there is a bit of an issue with that move. Who can spot that issue? And I'm going to play it anyway. I'm going to play it anyway because there's a follow-up to this. Yeah, that's the issue. But we can strike first. We can go e2 and say, no, 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 no. You're attacking the bishop. We're attacking the rook. Okay, he's just going to take on g4. That's a bit boring. And now we are up a rook. Now, the simplest is to say... Yeah, you can click king e7, defend the bishop. King e7, don't let him win even a pawn. He's probably going to... Okay, knight e3. Yeah. Now, all we need to do is just bring our rook, centralize the king, bring the rooks to the open files. Alternatively, as you're thinking, you need to be identifying the area of the board where you're going to create a passed pawn because that's going to be the way that you win the game ultimately. What I'm, what I'm seeing is these two pawns. I'm saying, okay... So when the time is right, I'm going to play c5 and d4. Not yet. First, I'm going to bring the rooks in. And that allows me to play fast. I've already charted out exactly what I'm going to do in the order in which I'm going to do it. So can you play d4? Not quite, because then he plays knight takes f6. The guy is very clever. 
So let's patiently bring the king up and defend the pawn. Okay. Now we can do a bunch of different things. The simplest is to go for the rook trade. That's a sub priority here. How does this move allow us to go for the rook trade? Well, as you guys can see, we are preparing rookie one. Clinical, simple, again, allows you to play fast. We're going to pre-move. Eh, I'm not going to pre-move. We don't need to. This is plenty of time, plenty of time to win an endgame like this. Because now you can start pushing the pawn. The only thing you need to be watching for here are forks. Forks, forks, forks. Don't get forked. Make sure the easiest way of doing this, positioning your king and your rook like this is not a good idea from that perspective. Because if the knight were to appear on e6 here, you would be in trouble. How should we play? What should we do? How, what is the final step in the chain? What is the final step in the chain? What should we do? We should go rookie eight and rookie three. Beautiful. And then that wins the game. Because that dislodges the knight. He has to go here. We take the knight. We withdraw the rook and then we promote to a queen. If he doesn't do it, then we take the knight and we promote the pawn anyway. Yeah, guys, you don't have to worry about the clock. I, I'm in control of the situation. I'm in complete and total control of the situation. I will not let you down. This is the current, the unit of time. When I look at this and I see 11 seconds, and I don't mean to be cocky, it, but it, it, it really is an eternity. It's an eternity because it's just, you know, if you, if you had three seconds, okay, we'd be having a conversation. I'm a professional OGM. That's exactly right. All right, you see? And with, with some time to spare. Okay. Um, just to make sure everybody's at ease. But that was much simpler than it seemed. This is just a forced mate. That was an elegant finish, though. I like these. I like this kind of mate. Bishop covers these squares. Rook defends queen and covers those squares. Rookie one was the mate earlier. Yep. Um, no, I don't think so. Rookie one, he moves his king. Okay. So let's analyze and then we'll wrap up. He played very well. You know, congrats to our opponent. He played, he played an incredibly good game. Now, again, I want to make very clear that from my perspective, when I compliment these players... If I suspected somebody of cheating, I would be very straight and I would say, I think this guy is, might be cheating and then we'd investigate the game. If I'm just saying that he's playing above his rating or he's playing really, really well, I'm not implying anything. You shouldn't infer anything. Um, and you also need to understand you, you shouldn't be somebody who goes around every time you lose a game where you feel like it was a one-sided game. I know some people like this they immediately assume their opponent is cheating. This guy is cheating, that guy is cheating. There is a big cheating problem. There's a lot of people who are cheating, but most people are not. And um, it's important to build up that atmosphere where if you suspect your opponent of cheating, the first thing you need to do is you need to go to the analysis tab, okay? This is a bit of a detour, but I and I don't mean to moralize, but this is a more practical thing. Let's say that you have the wrong you have a, a bad sense in your mouth. You have a bad taste in your mouth. That game was too clean. All right. You go to the analysis tab and you walk through the game with an engine. That's, that's all you need to do. And that'll give you a very good sense of whether or not your opponent, you have any leg to stand on even. This doesn't tell you whether your opponent cheated or not. It tells you whether you have any kind of a leg to stand on. Let me just expand all of this. The accuracy is a good indicator, all right? This is very misunderstood. If you played a short game that's 10 moves long, disregard the accuracy. The accuracy is only helpful for longer games to give you a general sense. Anything over 90% is pretty, is really good. If you're 16, 1700, really anything below around 2200, 90s games are pretty uncommon, but again, 99% is something a lot of people get at least once, let's say, a month. You will, if you play enough games, have a perfect game. You'll have a game where you almost didn't make any mistakes. Um, and then you can just run through the game with an engine, all right? That's all you want to do. 
you run through the game with an engine and you kind of check all right well was this move that i thought was suspicious was this a wait what's uh sorry you know was this a suspicious move you sort of see okay this was good but this was inaccurate you know this was best he played well but this was a mistake so clearly the guy is human and then he makes a very big mistake castles um when you get suspicious is when it's like every move seems to be very accurate or it's in the top two or three moves in the computer a lot of cheaters they will not make the top computer move they will make the second or the third move a lot of the time to throw you off another thing which is frequently misunderstood if i express my suspicions of somebody the response may be but on move 27 your opponent made a mistake so he can't be cheating that that doesn't disqualify somebody from accusations you some cheaters will throw in a mistake or two so it's much more complicated than that but you can use the analysis feature to give yourself a good sense of whether you or not you have a case if you have a case cl click the report button you don't need to make a big fuss of it chess.com does investigate all of the good faith reports uh, yeah brilliant moves are no brilliant moves are definitely something to feel to feel good about without a doubt okay um time on moves is also a great indication through the, the the classic three seconds per move kind of thing all right so also check their previous game history and stuff like that so knight f6 is the main move and after e5 d5 you get the main line theory of the scotch gambit i have a student who plays the scotch gambit i i i think it's a phenomenal opening for white very dangerous and up until gm level people don't know what to do even i am rusty on the theory here and after bishop b5 the main line goes knight e4 and you get this weird kind of structure where white drives the spawn into e5 and it's a super interesting line i would highly recommend that if you're tactical you want something that's relatively easy to learn you investigate the scotch gambit all right the other move is bishop c5 and white goes c3 again and after d takes c3 there is a common misconception not too often there's a common misconception where people think queen d5 wins a piece but remember forks need to be checked against move which may defend both at the same time i would call this almost a defensive fork a defensive fork is a move that defends against a fork in the same way that a fork works you defend rather than attacking both pieces at the same time you defend both pieces at the same time so in this position queen d5 is the right idea you don't want to abandon the idea but when you have a two move sequence right you want to go here and here what do you need to do before you abandon the idea you need to check what happens if you switch up the move order switch up the move order boom first now boom and yes you don't win a piece but guess what you've equalized the material and black's king is going to be permanently in trouble so this is not good so that's why we decided to go bishop b7 frankly i forgot about c3 being a move c3 is a super nasty move and in contrast to the bishop being on c5 the bishop being on e7 of course doesn't allow the queen to get out black is losing knight h6 bishop takes h6 okay so we play d3 trying to throw the spawn out on our own terms you will also see this in the smith mora in the smith mora you can play d3 in this position that's a pretty good line um which you know sort of gives the game more positional contours um it, this is called the, uh, the 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 scotch gambit but uh queen b3 is excellent going after the pawn going after the pawn knight a5 is a super common response to this and now things heat up bishop takes f7 king f8 queen to d5 frankly i expected him to go queen to a4 superiors think about the prime now remember this method of defending against uh the situation you don't have to keep the queen on the same diagonal you can shift the queen over and attack a piece that's undefended if you want to save your bishop or not give up a piece if black defends the knight well then the bishop is free to go back take the bishop then white takes the knight and you know material is equal and black's king is weak so this would have been a good move but this i thought was losing due to c6 now the knight is defended 
And I completely missed that after knight h6, he can just take the knight. See, I hallucinate too. This happens. You just hallucinate. I'm honestly not sure how a brilliant move is defined, guys. I don't know what the formula is. I would imagine that it has something to do with the sort of second best move not being nearly as good. But I don't. I really don't know. I, I don't check my games for brilliant moves, so I can't help you too much. I can. I guess I can investigate it a little bit. Yeah, so I, I was tripping here. I hallucinated. And obviously, if you if you play g6, then bishop takes g6 happens and black is busted. If you go d5, then the bishop can step back to e6. So this queen is amazingly well protected. So instead of going d5 and attacking the queen, we intercept the mechanism by bringing the knight out to f6. All right, hard to find. Yeah, stuff like that. Knight g5. h6, get out of here. And another great move, e5. Now, at this point, he already made a big mistake. I think that he still, in this position, I think knight g5 was a big mistake. I think that he should have dropped the bishop back to b3 and dropped the queen back and just brought all his pieces back. Although here, we still have these passers. So I would imagine, then, that queen a4 is indeed, guys, the best move here. Queen a4 would have been the best way for to an advantage. After queen d5, he gets into this path of no return, where his pieces uh, bite off more than they can chew. Okay, so e5, counterattacking the knight. Takes, takes, takes. Please ask any questions you have here, because I know a lot is going on. So now, if we count up the pawns, he's got six pawns. We have seven pawns. We're up a pawn, um, which, is, which is good. But more importantly, his king all of a sudden is the one that's unsafe. And we're seeing, we're doing fine. Okay, so bishop g6. What if e5 a move earlier? So if you got if you went e5 here, yeah, probably he should have done that, honestly. But it's a similar thing. Takes, 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 and we're fine. Um okay, so knight g5, h6. Why not take his bishop? Because then he takes our bishop with a discovered check. And we have to take with the king, and then his bishop comes out uh, pinning our queen. So that's unfortunately not sufficient. And now we decided to give this check on e7, testing the waters. And so, as I explained, queen e4 in my eyes would be a brilliant move. For a 1500, this would be a brilliant move. One of the factors that, in my informal definition, goes into a brilliant move is a move that avoids a tempting alternative. There was a tempting alternative, you didn't play it, you understood why it was wrong, Instead, you play the deep move. Thank you, Nathaniel, for the prime. Queen e4. Um, this move is good because it essentially forces the queen trade. Black has no choice. Don't go here because of mate. And... Oh, wow, that's really cool that the engines don't see initially. So it's it has to do with the depth, yeah. And, you know, you get an equal endgame. Black has doubled pawns, but you got the h file. You got a nice little pawn wedge here. So it's just a game. Um, but instead he goes bishop e3, which allows us to bring the knight into the game with knight c4. And now white is in big trouble. He accentuates this after castles. And I just have one really cool line to show you. Now what should white have done here? He should have taken and accepted a bad position, but probably a playable position after queen takes d3. Now one thing that I want to tell you, what should black do and not do here? Black has a couple of good moves. What move should be avoided and why? We can explain that. And I'll show you guys something very cool. This is not the main cool thing. Now, a lot of people here, it looks tempting, but you've got to prioritize development. And as a cautionary tale after queen e2, yeah, if you try to be cute, oh no, it doesn't work anyway. What I wanted to show you was the idea of bishop c5, which wins the game because of this mate idea. But black could go knight a4 here and get away with this by the hair on his chinny chin chin. Because bishop c5, knight takes c5. But still, I wouldn't bother with this. I wouldn't bother. I would probably just go d5, prioritize development. That is almost always more important. Now, the funny thing is, if he takes on d3 here, it transposes potentially to the position after d5 castles. This would have been the same position as in the game. Okay. So what the heck would we have done if he would have taken on d3? Well, the first move is the same one that we played in the game. It's knight e5. Okay, this is a fork, but it doesn't seem like a very effective fork because he can tuck his queen on c2. 
But now we take the bishop. And what I was thinking about was the move here. This is the crucial move. Who can, yeah. Well, you deserve a sub target at the top. You go queen to e5, threatening checkmate. And if he defends against mate, this combination of this combination of ideas just permeating and so on and so on. Bishop f5, yeah. Bishop f5, and the queen is trapped. There's also a check here to factor in. Bishop c5, but it doesn't do anything. King g8. White has only one way, I think, to, to extend the game. White has only one way to extend the game. What is it? What is it? It's it's um it's not bishop d4, there's a mate threat, guys. It's f4. F4 is a way to stave off the mate so that the queen can evacuate. You also have this move, bishop to d4. Um and I was calculating this, I wasn't exactly sure what we would have done here. But at the very least, the very least, black can probably go bishop f5 and, and get a nice position. So I wasn't sure. I still wanted to do this because it's a very cool idea. This concept of threatening checkmate and using the threat as a vehicle to set up another tactic such as a queen trap. Remember that, you know, this this it's a form of tunnel vision to think only in one direction. Either, ah, you want to mate him on the h-file or you want to trap the queen. You can combine these things. Thank you. So queen f3 makes our job easy, knight e5, and we win the queen. We win the piece, rather. And here we decide to play it very simple and trade queens. The rest is incredibly, um, incredibly straightforward. Thank you, third elect for the prime. Any questions about this game? I feel like people are still discussing the brilliant move. You can you can do your own research on that, guys. I'm not a specialist, so you're welcome. And again, I want to thank everybody for uh, for the. Thank you, Sky. Well, what if Bishop F5 instead of Queen E3? Um, well, yeah, Bishop F5 would be the move I would play in, 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 in a real game, in my game. But after Queen F3, the funny thing is, if you let his rook come to E1, our king is not exactly out of the woods. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk it. I would. This is we're up a piece and two pawns, and that's a huge material advantage. So I think a queen trade is 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 definitely the simplest i i usually tell my students that that being of a piece is the threshold when trading queens is almost always a safe path to victory um if you're up a pawn or two pawns unless you can transition into a pawn end game you shouldn't go out of your way to try to trade queens if you're up a piece or more and you're down in time you can consider a queen that doesn't mean you have to seek out a queen trade if if you're attacking but what i mean is to say Queen trades can be a very effective way to win when you're up a piece or more. Hopefully you found that instructive. Thank you everybody for the incredible support, particularly today. So uh, this helps me tremendously in keeping the late night grind going. I know I've been playing a lot of Blitz lately and sort of grinding my own rating, but we're gonna keep this going. More stuff on the horizon. Yeah, so thank you guys very very much uh, the community is always always phenomenal and uh uh take care you guys stay safe